Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations, and I'm joined again by Harvey Mansfield of Harvard University. Uh, this is three weeks after Donald Trump was elected, and mm -hmm. so you're going to explain the, the meaning of <laughs> Trump from a, the point of view of political science, political philosophy, and the yes, whole thing. Um, is, is, is Trump a, an altogether new phenomenon, or is he intelligible in terms of classical political science? And, well, let's see. Yeah. Right. Let's see. He's, he's certainly a challenge to, Trump is a challenge to political science. But let's start with uh, Trump as demagogue. The traditional term. Traditional of term of uh, Plato and Aristotle, a classical term, demagogue, also used uh, by the American founders as something to be avoided in a popular government. Um, demagogue in Greek means um, an actor for the people. Demos is the beginning of it. People, a people. Uh, actor, and it's um, unclear whether the uh, actor is the instrument of the people or the people are the instrument of the actor. And I think that's a characteristic unclarity of a demagogue. But the classical writers seem to come down um, at the end to say that uh, he's an instrument of the people. Hmm. So demag demagogues, demagogy is characteristic of the people. It's, so to speak, their fault. They are to blame for the people that they are using to um, gain their ends. Now, uh, and, and the demagogue also has this characteristic, which Trump has for sure, and that he's, he loves to be loved. And he doesn't worry about the quality of the people who love him. Right. He's only worried about the quantity. So he wants a lot of people to love him, and so, so to speak, without discrimination. And that bears a close resemblance to what we call a celebrity in, in, um, in our democratic society now. As a, a celebrity, I, w I would say, is right next door to a demagogue. Hmm. And uh, Trump, qua celebrity, uh, had a good preparation in life <laughs> for right. becoming, in politics, a, a demagogue, not so worried about the quality as the quantity. And that would imply that he has a kind of preference for uh, what is directly popular and not so much for what some thinker or maker of doctrine works out. So a demagogue doesn't have an ism. Hmm. He uh, is just uh, himself, and he wants to promote himself, or is it the people, or is it both? And so you can see three things that uh, Trump does in politics, uh, two of which are new. And the first, first is that he's, he, he loves big rallies. That's typical, traditional, with a demagogue. So big rallies in which uh, he gets to stand there and hold the attention of everyone, and everyone's looking at him and listening only to him, and they get it directly from him, so without the media. That's his great point. He wants direct appeal to you. But nowadays we have media. So to get around the media, Trump has invented this new technique, I thought, which I think is original with him for a politician, which is the tweet. Right. Yeah, uh, just a few words, and uh, but they always have a punch in them, and uh, and so uh, he can attract attention that way, and the media are in the position of having to talk about him instead of he having to talk through them. So it's uh, it's really an advantage. Uh, uh, a, a very considerable advantage to be able to to uh, to sidestep, get around, run an end round around the Washington Post and the New York Times, even the Wall Street Journal. Right. So they're all are, they're all listening to him. And the, and then the third thing that he does is be outrageous, and, and in a way that one has never seen, uh, I think, in an American politician, or, or certainly not in a presidential candidate. For example, referring to a woman's menstrual condition is uh, really forbidden territory, one would think. But he, go, he goes into forbidden territory, issues uh, insults, crooked Hillary, lying Ted. Okay. Those are 
things he likes. Epithets, right. Epithets, yeah. And, uh, and therefore it gives people the impression that he, as they say, he tells it like it, like it is. Meaning he goes beyond the barriers or the boundaries of good taste and of good manners, of politeness, of gentlemanliness, but especially beyond the boundaries of political correctness, so which are boundaries of our time, characteristic of our time. And, and um, that makes people think that on this other side, beyond, <laughs> he's um, found something, the sort of secret or the, the hidden cause of things. And uh, he brings that out, of the, out in the people. He appeals to what is hidden in our thoughts, right. uh, really our, our feelings, and gives it a formulation, brings it out, makes it public. So he doesn't exactly cause it in, in, in us, but it's because it's there already. But it's, you might say, a precipitating cause. It's a cause that makes the hidden cause our, our dislike, our uh, resentment, say, at uh, political correctness, uh, and, and, and brings it out. Political correctness is, uh, it, it causes a lot of um, resentment. It's, it's just uh, the most uh, maybe characteristic uh, expression of it is uh, euphemism. So today you get a lot of talk about undocumented immigrants. Right. Yeah. That's a euphemism. Why don't they have documents? It's, it's because they're here illegally. Right. <laughs> they should be called illegal immigrants. That's what they are. Um, that's the non-politically correct expression for them. I noticed that even the Wall Street Journal is now talking about undocumented elements. And of course, all, all the universities are up in arms about great dangers to undo the undocumented. So that, that's an example, and, it, and, it, and uh, he, so he, uh, Trump is appealing to those who are excluded from the benefits of political correctness, uh, for whom there is no euphemism. Right. <laughs> and, but in, in fact, uh, they can be called deplorables, right. and you can get away with it. <laughs> and, and, and so these people look on uh, those who are in, on the list, say the protected list, so blacks and other minorities, Asians, immigrants, Islamic uh, gentlemen. Um, so um, and and they see that they aren't on that list, and their and their interests are therefore not being uh, preferred. As, uh, as those others are. So, uh, so that's, uh, I, th I, th I think, the th sort of the, th the three elements of demagogy that you, find, uh, that you find in Trump. But then we characteristically call him, or his ideas, Bainism. So, and today in American politics, you can hear the word demagogic to refer to particular um, uh, at particular events or actions, but um, demagogue as a whole to describe someone is quite rare. Instead, we use the word populist, right. uh, implying populism. And so that's this tendency to rationalize the irrational and to make it respectable, bring it out. And so people will talk in, in terms, I think, more of ideas about Trump than is the case. If, if he's a, to, see, to the extent he's a demagogue, he doesn't care about ideas. He cares about being loved by no matter whom. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, but maybe he does have these characteristic ideas um, because he's looking at a particular audience, a particular section of the demos that is going to prefer him. And he also appeals to others who want to use him. So there, that another, that's another way in which, uh, um, you know, people are not so enthusiastic for Trump's ideas as they are for his ability and wish to change, <laughs> to change. And um, this is a kind of reckless word, change. Doesn't say whether it's change for the better 
or not, or what kind of change. Uh, just change as if we were desperate, as if our society were in desperate straits, and uh, we were reaching for any, any, any hope of safety. Yeah. Um, so that's um, uh, so that, that's this. Uh, uh, um, demagogy that he, and populism that he has, immigration, free trade, um, uh, pulling back from nation building, from right. neoconservatism, martial adventurism, right. and um, th things like that that he's associated with. But um, perhaps one should be careful of defining him by those ideas. And, and uh, he won't stick to them. This gives hope, maybe, right. uh, that he won't stick to them because uh, uh, if he is strongly opposed or if he sees that it isn't popular, he'll, uh, he'll do something different. On the other hand, he has this great confidence, having won against the odds, against everybody's opinion, everybody, every respectable opinion. Well, let's say not quite everybody, most everybody's respectable opinion. Um, he has a greater confidence in his own view than of others. So uh, we don't know exactly what we're facing. So let's go back to the demagogue question for a minute, and maybe you could distinguish that from the more traditional American, you know, common touch, uh, log cabin. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm struck that Trump did invent sort of for the modern era this notion of running his entire campaign as rallies. Traditionally, in the last week or two, you have big rallies yeah. you know, for general election or something like that. But the way you showed, let's say, Bill Clinton or most candidates showed empathy with the common man was to go to a diner and have a photo op where they'd pretend mm -hmm. to have a conversation over coffee. Hillary Clinton mm -hmm, did this mm -hmm. with regular people, reg ordinary Americans, as Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. said at one point. Yeah. But that's different somehow, I think, isn't yeah. it? I mean, so maybe you could it distinguish is. sort of, let's say, normal yeah. Yeah, they would democracy say, uh, from... from yeah. The normal uh, politician would say that, oh, you need informality. Informality is the way to get to the people. Right. And th they're right about that. But you can use this uh, lecture, that's what <laughs> Trump is essentially doing at these rallies, like a professor. You can use that in a very informal way. And he and does if, speak very yeah, informally. Very, of very informally and, and uh, with a lot of personalities. And uh, in his case, uh, insults instead of jokes. Right. <laughs> he doesn't have a natural sense of humor. Of no, he doesn't have a natural Demagogues. sense of humor of any kind. No, Demagogues don't, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Though, do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. That's yeah. right. And so, and so they, yes, they don't appeal to, uh, to the popular love of humor, like Abe Lincoln. Right. Who always had a joke. Right. Always had a funny story. Relax him you know, a little bit. No, he wants to keep you tense. <coughs> I guess that's yeah. part of it. And so, tense, so humor implies tense, some distance, yeah. maybe, right? It does. It does. Yourself, so, yeah. yeah, you're backing off. You're able to laugh, i.e., laugh at yourself. Right. Yeah. So, no, uh, uh, demagogue wants it. He's serious. You've got to be. And I was struck at the sure. Republican convention, and this is when I thought he could win, and I, which I didn't think he would win, uh, as most people didn't, but I th always thought he had a chance. When he said, Hillary, I think it's something like this, Hillary Clinton says her slogan was, I'm with her, as you, and, and he sort of ridiculed that and said, I'm, my slogan is, or I'm standing here to say, I'm with you, yes. which is a nice formulation, it I is. think, of a... Very nice, yes, um, yeah. Um, either a Democratic leader or a demagogue, depending on how you think of it. Yeah. But in a way, Hillary Clinton was too old-fashioned, perhaps, you know, or, yeah. uh, or the identity politics. I guess his appeal to the public as a whole trumped her kind of identity politics. Yeah, her identity politics comes out of, uh, the, might say, the twilight of progressivism. Democratic Party stands for progress. Right. But um, uh, coming out of the progressive party in the early 20th century, but it's been a long time since they've really believed in progress. Progress means that you can rationally say that some situation, some state of things is better than another. Uh, for example, it's better to be more equal than not. That's what they believe, but they don't think that there's any reason they can give as they are caught up in relativism and uh, in uh, the fact-value distinction 
and the inability of science to say what is good and what is bad. So uh, they have redefined progress simply in this word change, makes it much vaguer, uh, and, um, and it takes the edge off it, doesn't really promise anything except uh, as if you were to pick up America like a doll and give it a shake. Right. That's change. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, what they've come to identify as bringing more equality is protecting the most vulnerable um, sections of American society. And so that comes back to their list of the right. politically correct uh, minorities. And they forget about the majority as a common good. Where is the common good? It isn't there. The common good consists of a, an addition of, of the good of or interests of various ethnic groups. So that, that is really striking that wh even books that are written about the emerging democratic majority, they're just adding up minorities right. in order to make a majority. That seems uh, totally inadequate. Where is America in that? And especially where is America's pride? Or to think of Trump, where is America's greatness? Right. So. Uh, uh, and America's greatness, of course, gets lost, lost in relativism. America thinks it's great, so does every other country. Therefore, we're all equal. Right. Therefore, actually, the countries that think they are great are, are morally inferior to those who are satisfied with being Denmark. Right. Yeah. So, that's, uh, so that leads to a, a, a very weak, appeasing foreign policy a foreign policy of apology, as, as we saw very clearly in, uh, in Obama. So the status quo, the status quo then turns out to be the people who believe in or talk about change, even though they don't believe in it. Or you could say that progressives are people who um, have stopped believing in progress today. <laughs> Our friend Jim Caesar, I wrote a piece for the Weekly Standard, he was very struck by Bill Clinton, this was late 90s, use of I feel your pain yeah. as a kind of his attempt to identify with the public, obviously, in a yeah. sort of populist way, you might say, maybe a yeah. little demagogic way. Yeah. And I, I think he traced that back to Germany and thought nothing good would come of this kind of politics. But I guess yeah. it is striking that so the liberal view is sort of I feel your pain and what Trump's, but Trump doesn't quite put it that way. I mean, he does. Uh -huh. uh, talk about how things are bad and yeah. things have never been worse and yeah. it's the worst trade treaty ever so there's a certain amount yeah. of but he denounces it he yes. could, he denounces it morally right yeah this is very bad this is terrible right yeah. it doesn't have to be so it's less yeah. empathy and more yeah more justice or rebellion or rebellion or, uh, yeah uh, resentment yeah yeah nietzsche wouldn't like trump yeah there's a lot you nietzsche think? the philosopher opposed to resentment <laughs> he wouldn't like, I feel your pain either. Is that no. Right? <laughs> right. There's a lot of things he doesn't like <laughs> yeah. while we're talking about Nietzsche. <laughs> what about the founders, though? They might be upset by a politics that's a competition of I feel your pain or I, yes. or I express your resentments. Yes, I think they would. Right. I think they would prefer a politics of contentiousness, yeah. But uh, a politics where um, people propose for the common good or for the public good. Um, in, in America, one finds um, a kind of mix or a combination of two opposite things, uh, a can-do spirit. Things can be done. Uh, there are barriers in the way, but keep trying. We'll get it. We'll find a solution, and then we'll do something. We'll get good results. But then also there's uh, uh, a love of process. I've got my rights. You've got to respect them. And uh, you mustn't let your can-do spirit get in the way <laughs> of my rights. Right. So if I'm a small house owner in the way of a huge building that wants to get built, say, none of your can-do for me. I'm going to fight for my rights. And so somehow uh, it's, um, it's, it's been, uh, well, you, the, the, the people who stand behind the can-do spirit, I think, the common people who, uh, who um, want to get things done, 
who live in a democracy and they suffer from democratic impatience. They don't like long-lasting wars, for example. Nothing long-lasting. Right. Everything must be found and found quick. Freedom now. That's democratic impatience. And most of the desire for, progress, uh, for process comes from the elites. It's the elites who protect our rights, who define our rights. The elites consist mostly of lawyers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they stand up for things, which means they stand in the way of things. But our Constitution is a kind of combination of the two. It has a lot of rights in it, but it also has powers in it. So, uh, and this was meant to be a Republican Constitution that for the, that for the first time would work. That's what was promised uh, to us in 1787. All previous Republican Constitutions have been lists of wishes. Uh, if, if only the, the people could have this and that. And, um, and if only this would happen and other things wouldn't get in the way. Now for the first time, a republic was going to be made capable and effectual with a strong executive and not just a list of rights, but a separation of powers, a separation of powers which would have checks and balances, um, but also in the contention between the powers, something good or better would emerge. So having a constitution slows things down, slows down uh, the, the hurried impatience of a republic or of a democratic people. It makes you think twice. If you have to go bicameral legislature, it is, you can't pass a law just through one house. Um, you have also to get the Senate as well. So, and the s signature of the president. So all this is uh, supposed to add up to something more than merely preventing government from doing bad things, but also enabling it to do good things. Right. Give it more energy and give it more uh, stability, those two opposite characters that are promised in the Federalist for our Constitution. So uh, you could say that the Constitution that was, was set up against demagogy, against the demagogues. The main danger identified by Madison in, uh, in uh, Federalist 10 is a faction of a majority, not just of a minority, which most republics have been aimed to prevent, but a majority, because a, ma a majority faction, that is something that acts against the rights of others or against the common good, uh, looks like a legitimate Republican majority. It has, uh, it's, it's a seeming majority, majority for faction rather than for good. So, um, uh, th this uh, th this majority faction is, uh, is, is it comes to be seen as the main danger, and the majority faction is mostly demagogues, people, or leaders who are able to uh, bamboozle the people, lead them, mislead them, take them from where they ought to go, but perhaps where they might like to go. <laughs> right. Um, so the, the Federalist rather um, minimizes the contribution of the people or the, the, the blame that the people deserve for their resentments as opposed to their uh, finer feelings. <laughs> right, and Hamilton, I think in Federalist One, says in, in this as in other circumstances, there'll be these demagogues who try to arouse the public passion and so yeah. forth. But, but I suppose there is, in a way, a yeah. somewhat thin line between these demagogues uh, standing for public, you know, inciting the public and standing with them, as Trump says, and energy in the executive, right? It, it, Trump does appeal to something, I mean. Yes, or, that's right. Or fuzzes that over, perhaps, so. That's right. Uh, yeah, and there, so our founders also appealed to that, a kind of Machiavellian uh, love of what is sensational, of what makes a splash, right. what catches attention. That's what uh, Trump gets by being outrageous. And that's what Hamilton tries to, you could say, tame by, by um, giving constitutional expression to it. Um, 
enabling a person with ambition to be an outstanding person and contribute to the common good instead of uh, being uh, dismissed or even exiled because as one person with his own ambition, he's a danger to the Republic. So these ambitious, dangerous individuals are turned to good account in the Constitution, uh, but they're checked right. partly by uh, the other powers, Congress and the judiciary, but also partly by the other ambitious people because ambition is something that permeates our politics, I think. America is defined, American politics is mainly defined as the politics of contentious ambition, I would say, uh, in front of the people and for the approval of the people. But um, Somehow uh, Trump wasn't ambition. checked though by uh, yeah. either the Republican candidates they, or the... They tried. They did their best. I guess. There were too many of them. And, maybe they uh, weren't ambitious enough. I hadn't really thought about yeah. this before. But I had that right. instinct during the campaign that they uh -huh. were too. Everyone said that they seemed too, yeah. too conventional, vanilla, yeah. orthodox, and there was a way right. in which maybe well, they, under, a they underestimated. Need to be a they underestimated him and and, the, and his his attractiveness to to people. And um, but you know it's, it's it's hard to blame them for that, right? Because. Uh, uh, this was this is unprecedented that that such a person as Trump could <laughs> become our president. So I guess we've had many many demagogues and they've succeeded at various levels, yeah. of course, be it senators or mm -hmm. uh, leaders in other ways in, yeah. in the country, major figures, candidates. Yeah. I guess what's unprecedented is to then win the nomination and then especially yeah. win the election. And that's, that's, yeah. It's hard to really think of a president we've had who's. Yeah. Well, and yeah. of course, he is literally the first president who hasn't had government office or yeah. of some kind or other before yeah. becoming president, which is yeah. Andrew Jackson would be right, I guess. A, a close, but a long time, so what was a long he time ago, yes, and uh, governor and, and senator and military yes. leader. Yeah, he so. was and the same with Teddy Roosevelt, right. also very attractive rhetorically, but full of ideas, bursting with ideas. <laughs> yeah, more than Trump, Trump right. much more than Trump. <laughs> Now, what about populism? So that's the ism that people use to describe tr yeah. Trump and Trumpism, yeah, let's say, right. merging uh, conservatism yeah. and populism. See, but populism uh, really uh, first began in a political party, I think, uh, within Dem in the Democratic Party with William Jennings Bryan. So, thou shalt not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. Right. Yeah, so splendid phrases like that, and which stood for a policy, however, of the, you know, the silver standard as opposed to gold standard. So, so he was talking about an idea. And the Democrats stayed with him for three elections, yeah. amazingly, losing three times. So sh showing that uh, this had a certain lasting uh, appeal. And then in this way, too, the parties uh, um, introduce uh, a kind of anti-demagogic yeah, so let's talk about Flavor. the parties, because I think if you, if you want to ask a, an intelligent political scientist, well, what, what, how do we deal with demagoguery? One answer would be the constitutional system. Yeah. Uh, but another would certainly be, I think, the political parties, right? I mean, yeah, is, the yeah. parties stand for principles. And so I'm going to, say, Hillary Clinton's um, consolation uh, speech or, or, or what is it? Concession. Concession, or, sorry, concession yes. speech. Well, I like consolation. Consolation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it sounds yeah. grander. Or, yeah, we actually, uh, she did propose this consolation that we could stick together right. and our, our party will, will continue and you know, we won't collapse or surrender. A demagogue would simply be defeated and slink away. But uh, no, she's not that. She's a, a Democrat, and, and Democrats stand for something, certain principles, and they're going to be with us in uh, in 2020. And so, right. and you Republicans said, better look out because, uh, yeah. So, in other words, the parties stand for principles which are lasting, and um, have a certain durability, not forever, but uh, and they and those principles sometimes can change. Our policies can change, and the principles stay the same, or 
at any rate, there's a package of principles and, and policies which are, which is sometimes uh, vague or difficult to take apart, but but still it exists and it makes a difference between uh, uh, a party and a factious demagogue. Now, the political scientists have great difficulty in in distinguishing between a party and a faction. Uh, uh, the great difficulty arises from their methodology, their scientific methodology, which says that uh, facts can be known, but values cannot. So you cannot know that a party is more valuable than a faction, or that uh, they, they all the time speak of the party system. Why don't they speak of the faction system? Well, that's because uh, despite themselves, they do have a uh, certain feeling on behalf of parties. Parties are good. In fact, I don't know if a political scientist who said <laughs> parties are bad. Right. They all think that today that parties are good. They don't say good. They say they have a function. Necessary, but that's a, right. that's a fancier, right. more euphemistic way of saying that they're good because when you say function, you don't mean a bad function. You mean something right. that, that does good for you. So, and that is uh, that it organizes op opinion. Uh, it sort of, the parties stand in between us individuals and uh, the country as a whole. And they bring us together sufficient to make a majority so that the whole can be governed by that majority. And maybe that's not a bad uh, definition, though it's pretty vague. I, don't, I would especially wonder about the word organize because uh, the, what they're, an organization such, the, such as they're speaking of is something which is public and not something which is secret or private. Therefore, they're really making a distinction between party and conspiracy. And there was a time when all party was considered to be conspiracy, in a, even in a free country. And it was all right to disagree or to be an opponent of the government, but to get together in, uh, in, a, in what was called a formed opposition. This was in Great Britain. Um, well, regular organized, regular organized in a regular way in its, and in such a way as to be publicly visible and held to be respectable and legitimate. That was wrong. And so that, that was changed. Uh, that opinion was changed changed, in the, I think, in the late 18th century in Britain by Edmund Burke, and then in America in the, um, in the, in the Jeffersonians. So Madison and, uh, and Washington uh, deplored parties. Actually, Madison and Federalist 10 spoke of the, the, purity, uh, the, the spirit of party and faction. Yeah as if party and faction were the same. Well, they do, are they the same in this? They have a certain zeal. Um, they both make you contentious. And I think, but I think that, that the definition of faction was against rights, individual rights, and against the common good. Well, suppose you had an organization that was in favor of rights and in favor of the common good, like Madison himself, together with Hamilton, and the other Federalists, in other words, the American founders. That would be an example of a party that was good. But it didn't call itself a party because it wanted to stand for the whole. And so it's still held to this old uh, tradition that uh, party is by itself something of a conspiracy. And uh, so Jefferson came along and made a party that was open and public, he wanted to return America to its Republican, to, to the Republican greatness of its revolution against these oligarchical uh, monocrats, he called them, the Federalists. And the Federalists got sort of named um, against their wish right. <laughs> as a party. They became a party stumbling into it without really wanting to be one. Um, but the thing about Jefferson's Republicans was that it's just one party. And so later on, it it had to be shown that um, it was respectable to have more than one party. Going back a little bit to Burke, 
who had defined party as a body united upon some particular principle. Now that's uh, not a true principle, but a, just a particular principle, and there are other particular principles. Okay. And if, if you look at politics that way, kind of pluralistic way, there isn't a true principle, or at least in practical terms, uh, people won't find one. They'll only find a particular one that they like, and others will find. And so that leads to uh, the way in which we speak of principle today, as, in, as somebody is principled. You're principled, and that means you don't just act on your interest. You'll sometimes act against your interest. That's a sign that you're acting on principle. You do something which you ought not to like. You know? A man who favors fem feminism, for example, <laughs> would be a man of principle, <clears throat> though not of interest. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, and that, so principle is, uh, uh, is, is a way of bringing some justice and, s and some notion of good um, without some particular good or general good that you have to agree to. And so, and that's uh, what our parties, uh, I think, um, stand for now, and make, and they therefore make it. One can make a distinction in that way between uh, party and faction. So the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists didn't accept this, let's call it Burkean notion of parties. They just no. the Federalists just thought we're right, or we'll absorb whatever that's right. whatever's yeah. correct about the Anti-Federalists and have these amendments to the yes, Constitution. Yes, well, Burke was talking about English gentlemen, and, uh, and the Federalists was talking about American citizens, revolutionary it, citizens. Right. These are not people, not deferential English yeomen. Right. Yeah. These are... Uh, um, but they didn't anticipate after, Americans after their, the fight over the Constitution these parties were going to go away, right? I mean, no, they didn't. Right. That's right. Yeah. They would go away, and then, uh, uh, right, and uh, as soon as uh, the uh, country saw that good administration would follow, that was Hamilton's great thing. And that's, that comes back to our can-do principle, that the ultimate test of a republic is not whether it's Republican, but whether it works. And that's what Trump accepted as his ultimate test when he made his acceptance speech. He said, it's all, right, all very well for me to have won, but it won't do my love of fame any good, it won't do my reputation any good, unless I do a great job. Great job. Right. So that's, uh, that's, again, this American greatness and the American ambition, which is both national and personal. Um, He's, he's ambitious to make America great, but at the same time, and this is not incidental, <laughs> he'll make himself great. And now is this a break, therefore, with Burke and with parties? And, and I mean, is Trump, in a sense, what Burke was trying to guard against when he invented party government? Yes, These of course he was. Demagogues. Yeah, he, was, he, was, uh, <laughs> he was what both Burke and Madison were opposed to. But now we've got our system in place, and our system consists of the Constitution plus the parties and plus the media. So we've been seeing in the last three weeks uh, the accommodation of the constitutional system out of Congress and uh, not yet the judiciary to uh, Trump. And he's been making appointments of sort of seasoned, though conservative, politicians. Um, who belong to the establishment. And to his party. And to his party. I mean, so he's not trying to yeah. transcend party differences, yeah. it doesn't seem. Uh, yeah, but Trump, Trump could do as a demagogue. Yeah. I mean, other demagogues have tried that, right? Kind of. Yeah. No, he's not. Not so far, he's not. Right. I mean, there's no more anti establishment figure than in American politics since uh, that, really, to compare with Trump. And yet he owes, he owes his victory to two establishments. First, the Constitution, which sets up an electoral college right. and enabled him to win even though he lost the popular vote. And uh, second, uh, the party system, because um, it, he won because Republicans came back to him. They voted for him not because he was Trump, but because he was a Republican. 
and he ran behind the sort of yeah. House Republican vote. Uh, yeah. So it, it's the, right. now he, of course, hates that. But this, uh, this I think, might explain. He's recently been attacking or claiming that he would have won the popular vote if illegal uh -huh. voters hadn't voted. Yes. Seems to be not much basis for that claim since he's going to lose the popular vote by, I don't know, two and a half million votes or something. But, yeah. um, but maybe that's why he cares about that. I mean, that I think does he show something. He cares about that, yeah, and that's... He doesn't and, like being being yeah. obligated, or what's the word I'm looking for, being At the uh, same dependent time, he, on the Electoral yeah. College. Yeah. He's an excellent offhand liar. Yes. Yeah. That's part of being a demagogue, too, I suppose. I think so. But do you think he, he lies so much, you sort of, he lies unnecessarily, I would say, at times. Yes, right. Why is well, that? What's, how does that fit into the theory of not, the demagogue? Because it's not strategic. You can't predict it. Uh -huh. So he wants to be unpredictable. I think that's, but he wants to cause surprise. Yeah. And, um, no, he's, and I, I think that's calculated that he, um, you yeah, know, He'll, he'll stick it to you and, and uh, try to bowl you over and make you, as he's done, just with this claim, yes, everybody's talking about right. these millions of uh, illegal voters right. who suddenly um, were prevented from, um, from doing their duty. So or, should, should or, we be alarmed or, that or he's... Or bribed or whatever. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, he's so willing to... To use the yes, Donald, you've won. Stop it. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so is he no, right to no, think no. that he needs to keep doing this, or is he? No. Is this ultimately not in his interest, in your opinion? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, oh, time will tell. Yes, yeah. as they say. Right? Hard to say. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, the chances are pretty good that he'll overreach at some point, but one can't. Yeah, I, I don't think he's found it yet. And I think those of us who are more conventional probably underestimate the utility of that. Yes, constant we do. surprise and yeah. willingness to shock a little bit and say things that aren't true right. and then have the media complain for two or three days that it's not true and then he yeah. gets to look like he's just indifferent or right. above yeah. somehow these yeah. petty complaints. Yes. By lying, he tells it like it is. Maybe that's the way to end. It certainly is. And thank you, Harvey, for that really enlightening and thought-provoking conversation here three weeks after Donald Trump's uh, startling, surprising victory. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Thank you for being here and thank you for joining us on Conversations.